Hmm. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our uh, Progressive Democrats of America Town Hall uh, for Sunday, October 29th, 2023. Of course, we've been doing these since about February 2020. They started out with a focus on the COVID-19 pandemic, and we have stuck with it. And uh, we've discovered not many other organizations do events on Sunday afternoon. <laughs> and so uh, we sort of have the uh, progressive uh, audience. Uh, well, we're the, we're the big event at this time. Uh, among uh, the progressive movement in America. And it's been going great. And um very excited today that we'll be um, joined by Jim Zogby, uh, really one of the, you know, great, um, uh, you know, progressive organizers and voices in American society for, for many decades. And um, of course, Jim has been uh, an advocate for the Palestinian people across his career and uh, somebody who's worked uh, at the higher highest echelons of American, or in coordination with the highest echelons of the American government on this issue, and also very active as a grassroots organizer and a grassroots voice, um, uh, and an influential international voice across the world. Um, I, I did a little research on, on Jim Zogby, and one of the things I discovered is that um, uh, he has a very um, specific uh, and high, high, high level profile internationally. Um, across much of the world as a leading commentator on American domestic politics for the rest of the world. So there's obviously so much dimension to the crisis as it is unfolding uh, in Gaza, around Gaza, in Israel and Gaza. And um, we're just thrilled to have Jim to be able to provide his insights, his reflections. Um, and again, there's so much about it, including the the nature of the national conversation that's taking place within the United States, the response of the Biden administration, American political class, what's going on on the ground in Israel and Palestine. So, so much of what's going on, I think we're going to, um, Jim is going to be able to provide us a lot of uh, uh, just insight. And we're very much looking forward to that and thrilled to have him with us. And of course, we'll be getting to him in about 12 or 13 minutes. Um, and of course, we'll be hearing from Mike Fox in a couple minutes with our PDH to do's as he always leads at the top of the show, and then from Donna Smith with her reflections on the week in a few minutes. You know, I thought about, you know, this is the time where I sort of give a kind of, um, you know, non-polemical editorial for the week on what's going on in the world. And there's so much going on in the world. And of course, for PDA and for much of American politics, things are dominated by events in the Middle East right now. Uh, but obviously, some very high profile events have been taking place here as well, the whole situation with the House Speaker. Um, and that right now is important to highlight because it does seem to be resolved. <laughs> I mean, who knows? They're a crazy caucus. Um, and uh, and that means we're going to go into some uh, a phase where some legislation and some emergency legislation is going to be passed and some very, very core um, uh, issues are going to be brought up by the Republicans and put on the table where PDA is going to have to play some very active defense. Uh, and we are poised to do that. So with all this going on in the world and all this going on domestically, um, we're going to be in a phase where with the farm bill, we're going to really have to lean into supporting things like SNAP benefits. And I hope we can get everybody you know, to be attentive to that on the agenda going forward. And there's other components of the farm bill. Of course, we just introduced a, a progressive proposal called the Rural New Deal. And the details of that proposal relate to much that will be in the farm bill. And of course, this emergency spending bill that I, I lost track of the days, but it's coming up quick. What, 20 odd days? Is it less than 20 days now? I can't remember the precise date that was set, but we'll, we'll, I'll know that by Monday. And of course, what the Republicans are clear about what they want to target goes all the way to Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. And so again, vigilance, with our strong allies in Washington, like Social Security Works. Um, and, you know, Mike Fox and I will be on calls starting tomorrow, where I'll certainly be asking for coordination on those fronts and how we can create defense around these programs that need to be defended for the welfare of everybody in our society. Um, and um, so we'll be we'll be uh, fighting strong on that front. Across so much going on, you know, with the terrible shootings in Maine, um, again, we'll, we'll be working with our allies to elevate uh, the need for uh, gun safety in the United States on on all of the fronts where that the battle lines are drawn on that issue going forward. Um, obviously, crazy things going on with the presidential race. Not going to comment on those now. There are many other things I could talk about, but I do want to highlight this just at the top of of this 
from this week's town hall. <laughs> Something that probably isn't on many people's radar screen on the call, but is very much on mine. There have been a series of articles that have come out around the crisis of funding for the progressive left. I don't know how much people have seen this. And in some ways, it sort of cross-fertilized with some of the critiques of DSA that are spilling over into the media that pertain both to DSA's messages and attacks on DSA around their messaging on, on Israel and Gaza, but also around some of the internal dynamics of DSA and uh, how much it's now breaking fully with the electoral politics or, or getting involved in them. So there's that and there's the funding issue. And all of it is so relevant to PDA. And I'd be remiss if I don't start sort of every week letting people know that things are going well with PDA. We've had a significant expanse, expansion of our membership. We've got great projects that are developing and growing across the country, but we will remain a grassroots up volunteer led organization. We don't play in the same way in terms of trying to get a lot of big money donations. We feel oftentimes those put a lot of constraints on, on political activities, but we are not immune to needing money. And so in these last two months of the year, we will be having a set of fundraisers around the country and really trying to lift up and let the country know about what we're doing in our projects and be asking for support uh, across those events as well. And I'll be highlighting those as they come forward over the next two months. So with that, because that's a little bit close to the issue of PDA to do's for the week, Mike Fox, what is on our agenda? Salutations, sir. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, first and foremost, gang, I'm coming at. Oh, we got we still got a boatload of people coming in. I'm multitasking here. Everybody, um, co-hosts, please keep your eyeballs peeled on the waiting room. Admit, folks, we're we're getting slammed right now, and that's a beautiful thing. So, welcome all to the to all the new folks, uh, all the folks who are here every week. You hear me say this every week. Uh, so, chant it with me. To do number one is. Revel in the fact that you're surrounded by people who get it. This call each and every week, I thank you all, is literally healthcare for me. And we're going to be talking about uh, healthcare for all in our second hour today. Uh, I am a physically, psychologically, and spiritually healthier human being as a result of you all being here every week. So I thank you for that. And let's all revel in that fact that we are in a peaceful space and we are with people who are focused on making the world a better place. We can do it together. Now, to do number two, how do we do that? Number two is take notes. There's going to be a boatload of really good information here, and especially on specific ways that you can make a real difference. So make sure you got those uh, that notepad handy and um, act upon what you take down. Uh, now, from a very specific time and treasure standpoint, all right, from a time standpoint, I need phone bankers, phone bankers, phone bankers, phone bankers. Uh, we have a boatload of different projects going on right now. Phone bankers who are already here, toss into the chat why you do it and the link pdamerica.org slash volunteer. Help me bring on 10. We need 10 new people during this event. Um, we are not only working for peace, not only showing solidarity with our UAW brothers and sisters nationwide at the at the picket lines. We got a huge election going on right now. Final push in Virginia, so we got to have the phones on fire, gang. So please do um, set aside an hour and help us make something seriously happen. Danette will also be putting into the chat our congressional liaison uh, team. You can be a part of that. It's the single most important way to get federal legislation passed, good solid federal legislation passed, join your local team. Uh, likewise, Matt is tossing into the chat our YouTube stream. That's the easiest way to help out. Click like, 
Boom, done. We need 100 of those during this upcoming hour, okay? And then lastly, treasure. Our goal is always at least $1,000 so that we can bring on board, in Jim Langford's uh, words, uh, diverse and energetic uh, folks <laughs> who, I, I love that. I absolutely love that. He, he slapped me down before I was using the term young. And he said, Mike, that's ageist. It should be enthusiastic and diverse. And thank you. That's perfect, Jim Langford. And hopefully Jim will be with us later on today to share some really good news. But in any event, we're trying to raise at least $1,000 a day to uh, invest in technological upgrade. And secondly, diverse and energetic folks who can bring on board with the team to organize on the ground, okay? And I'll be tossing that into the chat. Hit that, and everybody, we've got great speakers today. Stick with us after our speakers wrap. Everybody on YouTube, you need to be signed up for our Zooms because we have family time after we wrap our YouTube. And we'll be talking about nothing but good news, nothing but good news. Stick with us. Back to you, Alan. Thank you. And this is a, a two-hour town hall this week. In the second hour, top of the hour, we'll be joined by one of our great allies, Chuck Pinocchio. He's led the organization One Payer States for years. And that is because Ro Khanna has introduced into the Congress the bill that uh, clears the way for there to be waivers if the bill is passed uh, so that you can uh, clearly move to have single-payer health care in individual states in the United States. So he'll be talking about that at the after the top of the hour. Jim Zogby will be coming up in a few minutes. I do want to say, before I introduce Donna, that, of course, one of the big events in the week was uh, the agreement that was reached tentatively between Ford and UAW. And now, again, whatever Chrysler's called, they now look like they're on the same wave. So only GM is outstanding. And I bring that up because next week, our guest is going to be Nina Turner. And Nina has launched a new project for uh, developing support for striking workers across the country, whenever they may be striking, uh, and to coordinate between the progressive left. And, and it's a project that we'll be partnering, or we'll be, we'll be allies on with Nina. And so she'll be on next week. So great news on the UAW strike front. Go UAW, Nina next week. And Nina will also be the guest that for the next episode of Positively Progressive, which will be posted, I believe, in the next week, though Don and I will talk about that because it will be coordinated around our upcoming uh, town hall, because the guest on the upcoming episode is Nina Turner. And remember to check out the inaugural episode with Tom Hartman, which you can, I'll, I'll add that link when we, uh, while we hear from Donna Smith, her thoughts for the week. Welcome, Donna. Oh, thanks so much, Alan. There's so much going on in the world, isn't there? And uh, thank you to those who've already listened to Positively Progressive, the first episode, and sent me messages. That means a lot to me to hear from people. If you ever need to reach me, it's Donna at pdamerica.org. Um, Alan, thank you for mentioning uh, some of the swirling information about progressive organizations right at the moment. I want to really give kudos to all of us from PDA, and, and specifically, Alan, for your leadership. You know, over the last uh, period of time, because it is true, there are a lot of progressive organizations struggling right at the moment. And I think we can be very, very proud of the work we've all done in our communities and here uh, on these town halls and everywhere that we do it, the Congressional Liaison Program. I mean, all of those things are going strong today. And that's a testament to all of you who have stuck with it, who have helped us build the organization, and I'm so very proud of that. I read an article this morning uh, in The Nation about, uh, and I'm sure, Alan, maybe you saw that as well, about the DSA and what's going on with them. And fortunately, they highlighted that Bernie Sanders was not a part of the dysfunction right at the moment that's going on. Um, and I feel, I feel sad. I feel sad about watching some of what's happening for organizations. I, you know, lest we think it doesn't impact us locally, here in Colorado, we have a very important local race coming up uh, in Aurora, which is the large suburb right next to Denver. And the person that we want to see be the mayor uh, was proudly touting his DSA connections um, until recently when we had a, a statement issued by DSA that was uh, um, very hard to, hard to absorb for a lot of people in our community surrounding the Middle East surrounding the Middle East and, and what's going on there. 
And very quickly, the mayoral candidate had to basically disavow that statement and talk about his stand as a democratic socialist, but not in alignment with uh, the radical statement that came out from DSA. My fear for him is that this is damaged. This has damaged his race. So if we think these things don't hurt, they do. And our speaking up, PDA speaking up in a sensible way with other organizations about this issue um, around the Middle East, I couldn't be more proud of the work we've done and the consideration that Alan has given to this issue because it is not an easy one. It is not one that's easy to navigate, Alan, and thank you for your for your work on that. It matters so much to me. And next week, I'm going to be uh, recording my third episode of Positively Progressive. Uh, this time, I'm going to interview a candidate who started just as a chapter member of PDA and now is an elected official, and I think that's going to be a lot of fun. So I'll keep you posted on, on what that's going to look like. Um, I appreciate everything you're all doing, and I can't wait to hear from Jim Zogby. He's been a friend of PDA for many, many years, and he's brilliant. So that's one of the main reasons I wanted to sit in on the first hour. The second hour, I want to be able to introduce Chuck Panaki to all of you uh, and share a little bit about the history of why this matters so much to PDA and Medicare for All and single payers. So thank you. And for that, back to you, Alan. And I just put in the chat, and we'll put in the chat again, the link to the episode of Positively Progressive. Over the last two weeks, according to our, our, our dashboard page on the platform, we've had a 1,338% growth in the listenership of the podcast. So that's the kind of growth we want at PDA here. <laughs> the kind of growth the progressive left needs, actually. If we're, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. We need to do in this country. Um, <laughs> that's nice to hear. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> sure thing, yes. And uh, and. Thank you, Donna. And with that, look, I, again, I'm just honored to introduce um, Jim Zogby. And at the top, by way of, of introducing Jim, I want to say that, you know, when we've been um, tackling this issue, uh, as people know, who've been attending the town hall, one of the frequent voices we hear is from Dan Siegel, uh, who's really a part of the sort of National Brain Trust of Jewish Voice for Peace. Uh, unfortunately, Dan can't join us today, would be here and maybe ask a question of Jim or comment later in the hour. He's at a rally on a campus in Indiana, in the state of Indiana. And then the other person I asked, SD Chandler, one of the Los Angeles leaders of Jewish Voice for Peace, and both Dan and SD send their greetings to Jim. She's on KPFK radio right now with Middle East in Focus, the station I used to be the program director of. So she couldn't join us. So J JVP is here in solidarity, but they would certainly want to be here in solidarity with James Zogby. And we are honored to have James Zogby with us. Um, he is the uh, co founder and president of the Arab American Institute, he's the author of many books including a book that I believe was originally published decades ago and keeps getting reprinted and is invaluable called Palestinians, the Invisible Victims. And with that, and uh, by the way, of course, a uh, fellow traveler with PDA from the time that uh, PDA was founded, uh, welcome James Zogby to our town hall. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Steve Cobble was a really good friend from the Jackson campaigns, uh, 80 88 in particular, uh, where he mentored my son and my son never, never forgot the, the steady hand of, of Steve helping him in his first presidential campaign when, when Joe was only 18. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this. And uh, I just want to tell you, you may have Sunday afternoon at four, but I have Wednesday afternoon at two and nobody cares about that one. So I've got the, I do it every week. Uh, I write a column weekly. Um, and then every Wednesday at two, we talk about the column. Um, and it's just do a half hour, but if people want to get the column, join us, uh, they, they can get my email is J Z O G B Y at A A I U S A dot org. And we'd love to, to welcome them. Um, the last couple of weeks, obviously I've been writing about, uh, the war in, in Gaza and, um, uh, and writing about it again this week. Um, uh, the, the first one I wrote, and I want to start there, it was called, um, no lessons learned, and uh, and I spoke about both Hamas and Israel and the the United States. How, in the situation as it was unfolding, it became clear to me that no one was learning from the past. Uh, in the case of Hamas, um, you know, you do something like that, and you commit an outrage in the way that they did. Um, that was day one, and they had to think about day two, three, four, five, and now. 20 something uh and they didn't uh 
And as has been the case way too often in the past, um, without a strategic vision, without a sense of how this will play out, they end up bringing hell down on their their people and providing uh, an opportunity, an excuse for Israel to do what it's been wanting to do, which is uh, destroy them, destroy Gaza. And I believe, and I'll get into this later, um, find a way to alter the demographic situation uh, between the Jordan River and the and the Mediterranean Sea, um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and so, I, I basically, you know, while I disagree with some on the left on this, uh, I find what Hamas did inexcusable and and deplorable. Um, uh, kids at a rave concert don't deserve to be massacred. Families in their homes uh, don't deserve to be massacred. Uh, people um, uh, who are as guilty of being responsible for the Israeli government as Palestinian civilians in Gaza are responsible for the behavior of Hamas, which is in both instances, they're not responsible, do not deserve to become fodder for the, the you know, the war machines on, on both sides. And, and a lesson I learned a long time ago is you never pick a fight, you can't win. And Hamas picked a fight, it can't win. And I you know, while while there's excitement in some quarters, you know, what they did was this and what they did was that bullshit. What they did was they killed a lot of innocent people and they brought shit down on themselves. And I think we've got to be clear enough as progressives, as hu human beings to say this was wrong. And I've known Hamas um, and its behaviors now for decades. Uh, they were Israel helped foster them as an alternative to the, the PLO. They wanted an alternative to the secular nationalist movement. Um, and um, and as soon as the peace agreement was signed, Hamas showed that it was going to do everything it could to sabotage that peace agreement. And despite the fact that Israel did not have the best of intentions in going into Oslo, and we've learned that now over the years, um, the suicide bombers were, um, were a, a destructive force that took the lives of innocents and also uh, took the lives of a lot of kids, uh, Palestinian kids who out of despair, look, youth unemployment in Gaza in the last 30 years has hovered around 70%, which means that a young kid in Gaza has no job, no prospect of a job, no prospect of a family, no prospect of living a decent life, and therefore ends up becoming ripe for exploitation in their despair, in their anger, in their frustration. They become ripe for exploitation by a group that has a religious ideology. They are not a progressive force. For God's sake, don't call a religious nationalist movement progressive. They're not. That said, Israel was looking for uh, an excuse, and they got one. And uh, what has been unfolding over the last several weeks, and I'm pleased to see that people who have not been the most progressive, like Patrick Gaspard from the Center for American Progress, now denouncing it. I mean, there are people now coming out and saying, what Israel's doing is as wrong as what Hamas did. And if you said that in the beginning, it was like, oh, my God, you can't equate the two. But at this point, you can. Uh, you can. You have to be able to say that Israel's massive retaliation that has taken the lives now of over 8,000 Palestinians is absolutely inexcusable and deplorable. And one has to ask about lessons learned. When has that worked? I mean, you know, the, the idea that uh, we've had meetings with people in the administration and they said, well, it, it's intolerable that civilians are dying, but, you know, we can't call for a ceasefire because if we call for a ceasefire, then things go back to the status quo ante, and that's intolerable too. And I responded, in other words, there are two intolerables and you've already picked one. And the one you've picked is the one that's going to condemn thousands of more people to die in the, the, the fool's errand of eliminating a group that you cannot eliminate. I mean, they went into Lebanon. Israel went into Lebanon in 1982. Um, uh, they were going to eliminate the PLO. And guess what? They ended up with Hezbollah <laughs> and they ended up with an intifada because the revolution on the Palestinian side went from outside to inside. Um, and then in uh, 2002, two, three, you know, we did the Afghanistan and the, the Iraq wars. We were going to eliminate Al-Qaeda. We were going to eliminate Saddam. We ended up with 
Al Qaeda metastasizing into 23 countries. We ended up with ISIS. We ended up with Iran not only having a foothold in Iraq, but actually becoming a destabilizing force throughout the whole Middle East and having a launching pad uh, from Iraq uh, in which they became a potent force, emboldened uh, to spread um, their sectarian uh, philosophy throughout the region. And we went into, Israel went into Lebanon in 2006. They were going to eliminate Hezbollah and ended up with a stronger Hezbollah. Um, we bombed Iraq, uh, uh, Libya rather. We were going to get rid of Qaddafi. And what we ended up with was a uh, a tribal conflict, a feudal conflict that is not going away at all and is getting worse uh, as, as we speak. Um, the lesson learned is that where there are underlying root causes to conflict, you don't eliminate the the party that has grown up out of the root causes. You eliminate the root causes. And uh, killing off a lot of people in Gaza is not going to get rid of Hamas. It's going to pave the way for Hamas 2.0. It's going to create, at the end of the day, as I've said, you know, when the dust settles and the tears dry, um, you end up with just a lot of dead bodies, a lot more anger, um, and and uh, and and the the seeds planted for yet another round of conflict. Who knows how many years into the future? It is um, it is a deplorable situation, and maybe most deplorable has been the response of the administration, uh, which is baffling to me. Talk about no lessons learned. Um, uh, we we we. We've told the Israelis uh, to be cautious about civilian lives. Bullshit. I mean, you know, I, I've been dealing with administrations on U.S. Middle East policy now for since the 70s, when I first started doing this work full time. Um, quiet diplomacy does not work. What worked is when we've told Israel, stop. They stop. Uh, there was actually an, an Israeli general when, when the issue of humanitarian aid came up and um the uh, the administration was saying we should get humanitarian aid and the world was saying it and the trucks are stopped on the Egyptian side uh, and Israel is making noises about not letting them in because of dual purpose and all whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, the administration said, send it in. And the Israeli minister of defense, Gallant, said, he said, we didn't want them. We said no to the administration, but they said no to us. And when America says no, we have to do what they want because they're the ones who supply us with weapons, and they're the ones who give us international backing. Well, if that's true about international, about, about humanitarian aid, it's also true about your behavior. And when we only say to the Israelis, well, you really shouldn't be doing this, and maybe you shouldn't be expanding settlements. And if we don't put conditions on what they do, they continue to do what they do. And they've dug a hole now so deep that, frankly, I don't think there's a way out at this point. I'm not sure that you end up with a two-state solution. I wouldn't know where you put the second state because Israel has gobbled up so much of the West Bank with settlements and with infrastructure, connecting settlements, roads and electric grids, et cetera, to Israel proper. It, it's inconceivable that you could evict Israeli settlers from these areas without a civil war, an Israeli civil war, um, and be able to create a state. And the, 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 the rhetoric from the administration, of, uh, which I've just grown weary of, that Israelis and Palestinians deserve equal measures of blah, 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 has become ashes in the mouth. It just, you keep saying it, but it gets worse because you don't take any active measures to stop it. So when I think of no lessons learned, there's the Hamas no lesson, there's the Israeli no lesson, and then there's the American no lesson is that we have become the enablers, the coat holder, the cheerleader, the weapon supplier, the diplomatic backer um, of a policy that is right now, um, and I, I use the word carefully, is it's bordering on genocide. Um, when you see the plans that the Israelis have discussed about evicting Palestinians from the north of Gaza to the south, and then preparing the way for evicting them into Egypt, when you see what the ministers in the government, Schmotrich and and uh, Ben Gavir, have been sending to their people in the West Bank because now that the the military is focused on Gaza, these two guys, these ultra extreme religious leaders, have now taken control of what's happening with the settlers on the West Bank. 
they're now sending out notices to Palestinians, you better leave because a new Nakba, that is the 1948 expulsion of Palestinians to become refugees, making them refugees, the new Nakba is coming. And already we know, even before this started, there were 23 Palestinian villages that had been evacuated because of the fear of Israeli uh, settlers uh, and the, the terrorism that is being used by them to force people out of their homes and villages, uh, away from their water, away from their orchards. And, uh, and that situation has only been exacerbated by what is happening in Gaza because under the cover of the fact that no one's paying attention, the situation has gotten worse. Um, Hebron, the city of Hebron is in a lockdown um, for uh, weeks now. And uh, this is a city of, you know, the, the metropolitan area is 300 plus thousand Palestinians and a couple thousand Israelis in the heart of it with military protecting them and checkpoints everywhere, locking people out. So frankly, the situation is on the verge of a, an absolute catastrophe. Um, and the administration has not learned a lesson at all. And what troubles me about President Biden is that he, there was a thing in the Times about his framing how he became pro-Israel and his trips in the 70s. Ever since I've known him, um, there's a, a sort of a mind lock. His brain got shaped in the 70s and 80s. Um, and he talks, when, when he gave that talk about Ukraine and, uh, and Israel and I, trying to sound like Churchill, trying to sound like Reagan. I mean, remember, neoconservatism grew out of the Democratic Party <laughs> and was it, it was Frank Church. And it got it, it, it. These folks all got after McGovern, they got moved into the Republican camp. They were neoconservative because they were liberal on social issues, but decidedly conservative on foreign policy and on military policy. And these are the guys running the operation right now in, in the in the White House. And I got a call from a reporter saying uh, the White House is, is saying that this is going to help Biden. He's a, becoming a, 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 a wartime president like Bush was. And I said, if that's what they're thinking, that's unbelievable. Number one, it's not he's not a wartime president because 9-11 didn't happen to us now. It happened to Israel. It happened to Ukraine. But there's no American who thinks that the war, I mean, Joe Biden seems to think so, but I don't think that most Americans think that the war in, in Ukraine or the war with Gaza is our war. Number one, we're going to have boots on the ground. We're going to fight to the last Israeli and Palestinian and the last Ukrainian and Russian, but that's not us. And sending $100 billion, which is what the budget you know, before the House is right now, they're going to break up the Ukraine part and the, the Israel part. I think the Republicans will pass the Israel part, $14 billion. I think that they'll hold up the Ukraine part. Um, that's not a winning ticket for Joe Biden to run for the White House. And because public opinion is decidedly shifted on this issue, um, in particular among what they call the Obama coalition, which I have some issues with to begin with, because it leaves out white working class voters who they don't really care about. They're like, that's like a wasted constituency for them. We're not Actually, they told me that at a DNC executive committee meeting one time when I said, what are we doing about Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, you know, voters? And they said, um, we're not throwing money away after people who aren't going to vote for us. I chair the ethnic council in the party and they just don't care. It's like they look at them. I mean, Hillary spoke the truth about how they think when they called, when she called them deplorables. I mean, white working class voters in those states are simply not viewed as part of the coalition. But even the Obama coalition is not siding with them. We're going to lose black votes. We're going to lose Latino and Asian votes. We're going to lose, obviously, Arab votes. We're going to lose um, youth votes. People are not buying this war in Gaza at all. And, um, and I'm following on Twitter some of the people in the, not, not the progressive, but sort of the liberal left uh, now outraged over what Israel's doing and the failure of the Biden administration to stand up against it. The question is, how many more people have to die before the president will finally say no? And even if he does say no, has not damage already been done? Um, and, and I think it has. And um, the toll taken on Palestinians is, um, it's irreversible. Um, and it will take, number one, more than half of the housing in Gaza has been demolished. Right. 
Um, and um, uh, and so the question is, even if they're able to go back, there's nothing to go back to. And who's going to rebuild it? Uh, certainly the U.S. isn't, and I doubt seriously. I mean, the, the Gulf Arab states have made a judgment on this years ago that uh, while some people judged them wrongly, I actually thought in a, in a credible way, they said, why do we want to subsidize Israel's occupation? If they're going to continue to do what they do, they ought to pay for the damn stuff. If they're going to destroy it, they ought to rebuild it. Why should we repay for what they destroyed? Um, and so I, I think that there's an issue here uh, of a long-term festering problem that has just been, the, the well's been even more poisoned than before, that will haunt the Israelis, clearly haunt the Palestinians who've paid a bitter, bitter price. And I think it's going to haunt American policy in the in the, in the the region. Um, and um, no lessons learned. Well, um, you know, I should let the audience know, and, and you'll remember this, Jim, I actually saw you at the St. Louis Democratic National uh, Committee meeting, and we talked about bringing you on for what seems like a, a subject that, of course, has been moved into the background, which was the issue of visa waivers and mm -hmm. the incredible imbalance. And you were writing about it before October 7th. And just around this time, I said, yeah, I'll give you a call. I'll bring you on to the town hall. And of course, I would have also wanted you to speak about, you know, there was this imbalance at the time in terms of the media coverage in the United States around Israel, Palestine, a lot of focus on the Supreme Court issue in Israel, the demonstrations in Israel related to that, and much less coverage of what was going on on the West Bank, where the the buildup and tension and violence and attacks on Palestinians was, was increasing and increasing and getting worse and worse. And the, the right wing, far right agenda of this Israeli government was apparent on both of those fronts. So I was looking forward to asking you about that as well as the visa waiver issue. Um, but um, I, I, what we do now in the town hall is I usually ask a follow-up question, which I'll do in a moment, but let people know that they can raise their hands and get on stack. And then you can have a question or a short comment you can share with um, Jim Zogby and we'll have a dialogue for the next uh, 25 minutes or so conversation. Um, my, my question, of course, focuses on the issue, and, and you've been brilliant on this your entire career, uh, navigating the terrain of public messaging in the United States. And obviously, it's a very fraught subject. Even just today in The Guardian, there was an article, and I'm out in Los Angeles, about the number of people who are, you know, losing their jobs, uh, you know, for some very sometimes anodyne and innocent comments mm -hmm. uh, because of, you know, who they work for and they get run out of their jobs or accused oftentimes publicly of being anti-Semitic. For statements, I see zero evidence of anti-Semitism. So I was just uh, going to try to throw out about three things and ask you to reflect on them. One is, at times, now we've obviously signed on to support the ceasefire now resolution, but in certain spaces, it's almost like they're, that you have people vilifying the word ceasefire and then the mm -hmm. accusations of anti-Semitism. So where, where do you see that now in terms of uh, how to message on that front specifically? Then I'd, I'd actually want to ask you about your reflections on Rashida Tlaib. Um, I do think Jamal Bowman, who is going to face possibly a potentially difficult re-election already, is almost certainly become, going to become a focus. So in terms of some of the outspoken members of Congress, another thing to throw in, I don't know if people know this, the last time I checked, there were 18 co-signers on the ceasefire now resolution, not a single non-person of color congressperson. Yeah. So where's Betty McCollum on this? And if you know any, any insights you might have, the people who had signed on to some, you know, solidly pro-Palestinian legislation, but have not signed on to the ceasefire resolution. And then finally, um, I certainly have been coordinated with a number of progressive Jewish leaders around trying to address what happened in the last election cycle, this incredible influx of money from APEC against progressive candidates. Sometimes progressive candidates who had no policies that were in any way overt in their public careers around Israel and Palestine. I can only imagine that is going to be fierce beyond belief. So all of that territory navigating it right now, the term ceasefire, the bill, the absence of people like McCollum signing on and how you see that, uh, Rashida and in particular, and how you view the attacks on her. And yeah. Have you seen problems with her messaging and then APEC in the background? Um let, let me start with uh, another column I did, sorry, mm -hmm. <laughs> the one I did for this week. Um, and it's on this issue of the um, 
the the home front, how it's playing out. I I um I wrote an article a number of years ago saying something about how when cancel culture became the issue mm-hmm. of, of the day, I said, uh, you know, Arab Americans know it because we were the original cancel culture. I mean, mm-hmm. um, and I remember when I started the Palestine Human Rights Campaign, my office here in Washington was was in 18th Street. And in the building was everybody from the Filipino human rights group to clergy and laity concern to groups with Salvadorian rights and an anti-apartheid office. So they were all members of the new the coalition for a new foreign and military policy. And because I, I earned my stripes in the anti-war movement, I thought I'm going to join. So we applied and we won the vote. It was 58 to three. And three groups said, if you let the the Arabs in, we're out because it'll undercut our credibility. And and so I left. I said, OK, I'm not going to not going to do this. I got invited to an ethnic leaders meeting at the White House with Vice President Mondale, went three days later, got a call from the White House saying people complained we had a pro-Palestinian Arab at the meeting. I hadn't even spoken at the meeting. Right. I was the kid there um, and I never got back even in it. You know, we've had candidates return money and candidates mm-hmm. reject endorsements and people hounded out of campaigns because there was an Arab in the campaign um, and uh, that, you know, got, got fired from a job. I've certainly had my de- share of death threats and the like. I mean, it was it was it haunted us. Um, and it was actually it was the Jackson campaign mm-hmm. that gave us our first opportunity to participate in a presidential campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it was the Intifada and in Oslo, which opened doors for us that all of a sudden became legit to talk about Palestinians. Um, and in the last 30 years, there have been ups and downs. But um, what's changed is that on the Democratic side, if you look at polling, um, mm-hmm. the, the the poll done before this um, by Gallup showed that Democrats um by a margin of, it's like, I think it's like 43 to 28 or something like that. It's like a margin of, of 15 or so points have a more favorable attitude toward Palestinians than they do toward Israelis. And a majority on both the Republican and Democratic side uh, support tying aid to Israel to their human rights behavior. Mm-hmm. That has become a problem. Um, and partly, you know, it coalesced around this changing demographics and and the perceptions that you mentioned, Alan, about how people are getting information in different places and therefore thinking different mm-hmm. thoughts um, and seeing the world in a broader way, uh, in particular people of color, um, that what we now have is progressives, people of color in particular, running for office. And um, APEC decided we got to nip this in the bud. <laughs> and so they began with the Bernie campaign, actually, Bernie was the first one since Jackson to raise this issue on a national stage. And um, but here's the thing about is that they're really smart because mm-hmm. they know that there aren't five votes to win by saying oppose yeah. him because he's anti-Israel. So right. instead, the attacks on Bernie were he's too old. He's a socialist. Right. He's going to cost us down ballot tickets, you know, d- down ballot co- contests. The Nina Turner attack ads were. She said this about Joe Biden and she's what kind of Democrat is she? The attacks on Summer Lee were the same. The mm-hmm. attacks on Jamel Bowman were something about it. One year he didn't pay his taxes on time. And that was they went after him on the character issue. Mm-hmm. And um, and they know there are no votes to win. On their side, so what they, they'll do this ad. He's this, he's that, he's this Democratic majority for Israel. Like mm-hmm. what have they got to do with Bernie mm-hmm. being too old and a socialist? Right. Uh, but. Uh, to date, it's it's worked in some races. They haven't won a lot. They, it's an even split almost in terms of what they won and what they lost. But I I understand that that this year they're going to be coming full tilt on on some of these. And uh, I worry about Jamal Bowman. Mm-hmm. Uh, I worry about Summer Lee. Uh, they have to find candidates yet. They haven't been successful in finding winning mm-hmm. candidates. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Um, I'm not as worried about Rashida, even though you know, our defenses will be up because right. Rashida has this a- a amazing ability to become everybody's sister or daughter in whatever district. she. I've known Rashida since she was really young and ran for state house in Michigan, ran in an all Hispanic district. And people said she'll never win. She's not Hispanic. 
She beat everybody. She ran, they got merged into a black district, became majority black district. She won again. She ran for Congress, ran against Conyers and Coleman Young's, you know, she ran against everybody that should have beat her. She won again. And so she she's a winner. She's a tough, tough candidate who, while yes, will be seen nationally on Palestine, but in her district is mm-hmm. focused like a laser beam on issues that affect her 13th congressional district at home. And she's brilliant in that regard. Um, I have less concern about her than I do about some of the others, because mm-hmm. she does have a track record at home uh, earned from her time in the state house. Uh, and then as an environmental lawyer uh, in, in Southeast Michigan. Um, but we'll still keep our eyes on that race. And, and, and Cory Bush is going to, is, is the same kind of thing. They're going to be going after Cory Bush. So I, I think, while I'd like to go on the offensive, and I know folks have talked about it, right. I actually think that our biggest challenge right now is to defend the one the wins that we've gotten, and the 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 best way to defeat the APAC packs and the the Democratic majority for Israel is to save the candidates who they want to take out. Um, so that's our our biggest challenge there. Yeah. Um, I. Um, uh, there were some other issues you raised, and I'm. Oh no, I think I think you covered them for the most part. I mean, just simply, uh, I'm going to ask a direct question about Rashida. First of all, I've been very close to Rashida Tlaib. Lee. People might remember I did an in-person fundraiser with her, just Rashida and myself, out in Southern California. Had a great relationship, um, but of course, they there does seem to be this national effort to vilify her. We see this censure motion on the floor, and um, I I've looked at her statements. I have found no problem with her statements. I I um, I mean, is, is this just uh, they just decided this person will be vilified. They're going after her because um, I want to be clear. We're scheduled to do an event with her. It might get canceled uh, in in later November in Arizona. I certainly in no way at all want to do anything except you know support Rashida unless there's something I've missed. You um, you've missed nothing. What you've missed is if if anything is the 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 almost rabid right um, consuming hatred of this woman. Mm-hmm by folks on the far right, uh, and in particular, the far right in the, in the pro-Israel community. Um, they hate her. And, uh, and who, who did the censor motion, censure motion? Yeah, right, right. It was right. Jewish space laser, uh, Marjorie <laughs> Taylor Greene. I mean, yeah. I mean, Republicans, it's like they live in an alternate universe, right? Is mm-hmm. that the folks going after her are the craziest people on earth. Well, you know. uh, and yet they get credibility on their side but um, she will be defended by most Democrats. I mean, there's that little caucus of some of the really hardline folks on the Democratic side who will take it. But Hakeem Jeffries is going to defend her. Sure. She's not going to be left vulnerable. And um, and I think that, um, yeah, you you will look at her statements and find nothing. Right. They will look at her statements and find Rashida said it. And <laughs> yeah. that's yeah. that that does it right there. And just finally, a little guidance on messaging, and then we'll go to Dorothy Reich and Mar- Marcy on everybody. The the term ceasefire. I mean, it's just crazy. anodyne. It's just that? it's yeah. Look, that is not the answer right. at all, but it is the answer precisely because they've gone so crazy about it not be. I mean, I know exactly what you're talking about. You say ceasefire, and they call you an anti semite right. because you're not letting Israel exterminate the Palestinians in Gaza. I mean. This is how cra- I remember Dan Berrigan. I don't know if you all remember oh, yeah. Dan Berrigan. He was sure. a friend and sure. mentor of mine. And Dan used to say, um, when, when, when you're in a world where two plus two isn't four anymore, then you know what the job is. It's to say, damn it, it is four. Right. Um, and, and when you look at slaughter going on and you can't say ceasefire because, well, that's, we, we, it would be intolerable to go back to status quo ante. Well, for God's sake, what's better than, then status quo is stopping the murder of thousands of people. I mean, I, I have a, a dear friend who was wanted to take a bet with me a weeks ago. She said, I even hate to say this, but she said, I, when do you think it'll go over 10,000 wow. dead in Gaza? And I said, I don't think it's going to, I'm not going to make that bet. It's gory. I, it is going to go over 10,000. And here's one other thing about media coverage. Mm-hmm. There has been a shameful, I mean, look, one of the problems in American media has been that Israelis are viewed as real people and Palestinians are an ob- uh, objects. They're a collective. They're 
they're de- depersonalized. Um, so you you get you'd get in the beginning for the first week and a half or so, it was funerals of Israelis on the front page photos. And when you get the pictures from Gaza, it's rubble, right? Don't Palestinians cry when people die? I, I remember back in the anti-war days, one of the speeches I gave that people said it was being dumb, but it, it wasn't being, to me, it was like, I, I gave a talk and I said, Vietnamese have mothers too. And, um, and it was like, it was sort of dumb, but it was so obvious that for God's sake, they're real people. And, right. and they're more than the weekly, I don't know if you remember on TV, there'd be the weekly body counts, you know, mm-hmm. the, the, the thousand Americans and the, the, the 15,000 Vietnamese, like they didn't really even count as people. Um, but, but what's been more troubling even than the depersonal, the, the dehumanization of Palestinians has been this sense that they can't count their own dead. Right. They can't count their, what, what the reasons racist because they're Arabs and Arabs lie. And so now in the newspaper, it's, uh, it all began on October 7th. It's almost every story has to have this in. I can't count how many times in the New York times and Washington post today, I saw 1400 Israelis killed and 200 taken out. Every story has to have that in there. Even if it's like four stories on one page, it's got to have that line in there. And so Israelis get to count 1400 dead, but then Palestinians, and Palestinians say mm-hmm. there were this many dead, as reported by the Hamas-run Ministry of Health. Um, so the lesson you, you get out of this is you can question the number of Palestinians who die because they lie. You can never question the number of people that the Israelis say die because their people count mm-hmm. and their people matter. And that is racist on both sides. Of mm-hmm. of that that uh, that 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 equation, so frankly, and if you look at Save the Children, accepts the the Ministry of Health, UN accepts the Ministry of Health, um, the Catholic Relief Services today uh, validating that yes, the Ministry of Health counts the dead right, and the Ministry of Health issued a thing with all the names of the people who've died, um, but that sense of how the media. Um, distorts the message and obfuscates so that, well, that's what they say died, but probably didn't because, you know, it's Hamas, right? And they're not going to tell us the truth. But for God's sake, the Israelis always tell us the truth. And if you don't, if you question it, then it's akin to anti-Semitism because you're questioning Israel's right to count its own dead. Well, what is it when you question Palestinians' right to count their own. I mean, I remember there'd be Israeli airstrikes in Gaza, and the Palestinians would say, you know, 14 people died, and the Israelis say, no, from our or from our count, it was only three. Well, I say, from 30,000 feet in the air, how do you know more than the people on the ground taking bodies out of buildings, right? I mean, but there is that sense that you can get away with it because you're Israel and you tell the truth, and these are Palestinians and they don't tell the truth. And that's I'm going to stop there. A lot of questions. You know, and, and, uh, and I'll just add too. It's my understanding that uh, I mean, I've been following this, of course, hour by hour, day by day. Um, that as of two nights ago in 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 Gaza, they basically shut off communications coming out, and it was the largest dropping of bombs to date. Yeah, and I don't think the information has come back from that and yet. People here in in the states who have family there are just devastated because oh. they can't, they can't communicate. Um, they can't communicate. Um, let's go to the stack and we only have a little time. I apologize to everybody, but I obviously with the work I'm doing on the messaging that we do at PDA and how fraught that process is and how careful we're trying to be and not at the same time, uh, move away from our convictions. Uh, I really appreciate the counsel you've provided for that, Jim, in your answer to the last question. Dorothy Reich, um, your question or comment for Jim Zogby. Um, hi, Jim. Uh, well, people who know me know that I've been following this for probably 15 years. Every I, I realized when I had a bunch of Middle Eastern kids working for me that they all got along, the Egyptians and the Israelis and the Persians, and you know they all were the same. And that it was, a, as usual, a Northern European problem here. And they decided to send the, the Jews from Europe over to the Middle East to get them out of Europe after World War II and caused the Napa and everything that's been going on since. And the, I 
been telling people for 15 years, watch Occupation 101. This cannot go on. This will not stand Palestinians or people, and you can't keep them prisoners forever. Mm -hmm. uh, every morning I'll get up and I send out a newsletter, and one of the things I search is Palestine News. I don't even call it Israel. I call it Palestine News. That's me. And I'm Jewish. And almost every day you find a killing of a, Pal of a Palestinian teenager. Day mm -hmm. after day, 260 of them. And counting, and they were doing this to take over the West Bank. And meanwhile, they turned they they turned their eyes away from Gaza, and now we have this. But the whole, I mean, what har what I'm afraid of is I see the ratio of Israelis to Palestinians. It's one pal one Israeli released for a thousand Palestinians released. So I just wonder if I do the math right, if we're looking at a million two hundred thousand Palestinians have to die to make up for 1,200 Israelis. And that terrifies me because they're capable of doing that. Um, uh, but I think they're, 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 and they, hmm. they want to kill the children. I, I know a lot of Israelis. I deal with Israelis all the time because they're my clients. And they, they want to kill the children. If you live and you said it yourself. Um, maybe um, you prompted, thank you for your comments and questions. I think you probably prompted, um, um, Jim earlier had uh, noted that he was going to maybe speak to the issue of demographics. And maybe Jim, this is an opportunity for your reflections on that subject. Yeah, um, the, the percentage of people between the West Bank and between the Jordan River and Israel, um, it's now even split between Palestinians and and Israelis. And um, if they are going to maintain control over this whole thing uh, and be a Jewish state, they needs to be a Jewish majority state. And Gaza uh, presents a problem because it's 2.3 or 2.4 million. Um, getting rid of a million or so of them, and I don't think they'll kill them. I think they'll force them across the border to Egypt and, and, and into the Sinai, where they've offered to erect camps for them, which Palestinians have lived in tents enough times. Um, uh, it would change the demographic balance. Um and I, I guess I, I've always been so frustrated by even some of the groups on the liberal side uh, in the Jewish community would, would talk about the demographic problem. We need a Jewish state and, and, and because of the demographic time bomb. And I thought, that's like a white guy in Alabama saying we need to deal with the demographic time bomb of too many black babies being born or too many Latinos coming into the country. It's like uh, these are people real kids and people and you're right i mean there there is there has been in the rhetoric of some on the far right in israel there's been a rhetoric about i mean the former minister of justice um she said uh the, the, these mothers are giving birth to snakes and so it's better to kill the snakes you know kill the mothers because then they can't give birth to any snakes anymore and um and she was part of Netanyahu's, uh, one of his ministries. Uh, I forget her name now. Um, she was a pretty awful person. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there is this sense that they can use dehumanized language about Palestinians to get away with it. But if a Palestinian minister of justice said it, all hell would break loose and should break loose. Mm -hmm. Because that language is deplorable, unacceptable. Um, listen, if we're going to run out of time, Alan, let me repeat my 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 my, my email I, if you write me, I write back. I do all the time. If you want to, my email is jzogby um, at aaiusa, one word, dot org. Um, I would be more than happy to respond to any question you have. Um, and if you also want to um, get my weekly column, just put that in the note and we'll add you to the list. Um and with regard to the some of the issues around the founding of the state, my book, Palestinians, the Invisible Victims, is a short little book, and it talks about that, and we'll tell you how to get it if you write to us. Um, but yeah, I think there's, uh, maybe we got a couple more in. Uh, you tell me, can we get- yeah, Let's go for a couple more in. You can follow me on Twitter, too. You can DM me on Twitter. It's JJZ1600 um, 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 on X, sorry. 
<laughs> um, Marcielle, a uh, quick comment or question, and let's get Paul in for sure. And maybe we can squeeze William in. We'll see what we can do. But Marcielle, go for it. And uh, Okay. I've been following the Palestinian thing for many, many years. And I get um, the email, Palestine Legal. One day, one of my students, I said, how do you say Palestinian in your language in Arabic? And she said, Philistine. And it, my brain exploded because if anybody knows what the word Philistine means, you know, it's a heathen. And, and so I just wrote a, uh, an article. I sent it to Alan and some other people. I hope they don't mind. And it's called Philistine. And um, I do want to know, uh, Jim, will you kind of answer the question? I looked you up while we were all talking. Um, so I am going to email you and also get your book. So I guess I don't need to ask you how to reach you because I'm going to email you. Thank you so Got much. It. Thank you. Um, let's go straight to Paul. Paul McDermott, please unmute. Yes. Um, hello, uh, Dr. Zogby. It's great to see you on this program. I watch your uh, podcast uh, religiously every uh, Wednesday, and it's great to see uh, both of you together, my two great uh, heroes. Uh, my question about this uh, conflict um, is, uh, uh, you know, uh, Biden's uh, one-sided support um, in this uh, uh, conflict uh, is having ramifications. I can see the conflict uh, spreading uh, in in the region, and uh, if, if this um, widens, how will um, uh, Biden's uh, re-election uh, uh, how how will Biden's uh, re-election be affected by the spiking oil, oil prices and by the fact that a lot of Arab Americans have just uh, uh, thrown in, thrown the towel in as far as supporting uh, 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 Biden? Yeah, we just finished a poll. Uh, we'll be coming out with it Tuesday. Um, the Arab American numbers are 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 basically in the toilet right now for Biden, mm -hmm. and, and and across the board, generational, um, those in their second, third generation, the uh, Lebanese, Catholic, Muslim, whatever, all the demographic groups are are are, are there, um, and I, 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 unless something dramatic happens in the next year. Um, Arab Americans are going to come back, which is for me a lifelong Democrat, not a fun prospect. Um, but uh, you know, he, he's done real damage here. Um, uh, and I, I, yeah, I mean, it, it that, that's going to be that's going to be a problem. But I think that it's going to be a problem, as I said, for many of the subgroups in the Democratic Party um, who are also not interested in another forever war, or whatever the term of of art is, and will actually help Trump. I mean, it'll actually help him because he has been opposed to these uh, these kinds of wars. And, I, you know, when I saw aircraft carriers and destroyers in the eastern Mediterranean um, threatening Iran and Hezbollah uh, and 4000 Marines off the shore, I'm saying, what what, what are we thinking here? Is, I mean, do we really want to get into this thing? And I've learned if I've learned anything over the years, it's that when you preposition that much military force, you ultimately are going to use them in some form. Or, and I just don't think that Americans, liberals, conservatives, whatever, are going to accept um, uh, ground forces and or the U.S. engaged in a military conflict in 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 that region again. Um, when the last several ones that we've been involved in in that region have not actually gone so well, and and this one certainly won't. Um, yeah. I want just Alan one thing about you said when you were talking about the I talked about the past the cancel culture, but you're so right. What we're seeing is corporations literally being uh, pressured by the ADL to issue statements of support for Israel. And when they don't, they're called out for it. Co corporations, universities, uh, the ADL has gone overboard on this. And I've actually heard from some people in companies where they have signed, they've, been, they've signed a statement saying that they will oppose efforts to delegitimize Israel and criticize Israel. And they will accept the, this definition of anti-Semitism that includes criticism of Israel. And then, um, Employees in those companies are asked to sign a statement that they will adhere to company policy. Um, 
So I guess we'll get a hearing at some point with, are you now or have you ever been yeah. a supporter of? Um, and student groups, the, the ADL wants college campuses to ban Students for Justice in Palestine uh, because on the material support provision that they're giving material support to Hamas. Now, have some of the student groups said dumb things? Of course they have. I was in a student group and I said some pretty dumb things too. But does that constitute material support for the Viet Cong? No, it did not. It, I was opposed to my government policy. And these are student groups opposed to what Israel is doing, uh, supporting Palestinian rights. And they're now being threatened with being decertified on campuses and charged with material support. Um, there is a McCarthyism here brewing, and I don't think that it's going to sit well with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. I do agree. Um, uh, of course, some people are having their lives impacted in these weeks where this is hitting people directly. And it's uh, again, there was an article in the Guardian today, um, I, but you know, the the, the instances mm -hmm. are specific. Um, um, so, um, Sue Weisner asked a question about. Uh, you know, there's this willingness to call for a pause, but not a ceasefire. Um, obviously, there. I mean, I can maybe I can speak to that. A pause goes back to dropping bombs. A ceasefire calls for the ending of dropping bombs until yeah. negotiations happen. So there's a constitutive difference there. Um, and then I just want Bill Bronston to have the final opportunity to ask a question. Bill, if you can unmute, um, please unmute, Bill. I know you had your hand up. And everyone else, if they can please write Jim directly if they have a question for Jim, or bring it up in family time later today. Um, Bill Brownson, you're up. Jim, I have two short but big questions. Number one, can you talk a little bit about Netanyahu's support of Hamas for his interests? And secondly, is there any residual impact of the major demonstrations against Netanyahu that, that remain as a result of this war that's, that's going on there? Is, is there any progressive uh, uh, Israeli uh, population that's still in place to oppose Netanyahu and to address the need for peace in the region. Well, the demonstrations, number one, had nothing to do with peace in the region. And that was the, the way it got bifurcated was all about his judicial reform and people concerned about the ultra religious, the ultra orthodox uh, laying down certain regulations and imposing their religious belief on practices in the state. That was what it was about. Uh, efforts to tie the two together were, uh, you know, they avoided it and not only avoided it, but tried to, you know, push it off the agenda completely, which is why Israeli Arabs, for example, Palestinian citizens of Israel didn't participate and why the, the, the remnants of the peace movement in Israel didn't participate to a great extent because there was no anti-occupation component there. So uh, I, I think that there is the sense here that um, everybody's un Gantz is in the government and, uh, you know, they're, they're moving forward on conducting this war. But when it's over, if it's over, uh, we'll see whether there's a residual, whether the demonstrations start up again. We'll see whether or not Netanyahu needs or wants to do it. I mean, look, this was all about Netanyahu not wanting to go to jail. And so he right. wanted to gut the courts. <laughs> so that the three indictments against him would not be followed through on and they could change policy um, so that he wouldn't uh, get indicted, he wouldn't be removed uh, as prime minister. I don't know what, what comes after that in terms of internal Israeli, but it kind of depends how it ends, right? Uh, if it ends, um, if if it keeps going for a couple of years, um, we could be in the same situation for, for quite a while. If it ends uh, because the U.S. forces him out uh, to stop it, which I is slim, but it could happen. Um, remember, Reagan said no to Begin, and that put the lid on it, and it stopped. Um, but if it does, then I think Netanyahu would be in real trouble. So he probably has no interest in ending it quickly, because it, he would then be called to account for how did it start in the first place. But it will not make a difference fundamentally in terms of the the, the relations with the Palestinians because they think that well has been so poisoned. Um, and, and again, poisoned because Hamas did a deplorable thing, an absolutely deplorable thing. I, I think it, it, it is wrong to even begin the conversation without acknowledging that from the get-go. And it's also been poisoned um, in, in a very serious way by the way that the Israelis have behaved because Palestinians are not going to be any more friendly 
um, toward the prospect of an occupation uh, if the war in Gaza ends because of the way they've been treated in Gaza and in the rest of the in the rest of the uh, the West Bank during this period. So I I would expect everything to be on steroids when this is over. Um, and how it ends in part uh, will, will determine it. But I think um, uh, probably one of the reasons, you know, that Israel is looking for a long war is, is that Netanyahu needs to alter the circumstances internally, politically, uh, because if it ends with him being humiliated, he's gone. And then he goes to jail. <laughs> and it's uh, something he's been trying to avoid uh, rather, uh, re you know, in a rather determined way. Thank you all so much, Alan, and and all of you for this. Um, wish I could spend more time. And if you want to have me back, please do, because yeah. um, I got Sunday at four o'clock is always good for me. <laughs> Sorry. By the way, we have our PEA staff meeting when you have your call. Uh, maybe we'll I'll, I'll bring it up on the staff. We've tried to shift it. It's difficult. You know, people's schedules are locked uh, right at the time that you have your call. And I'm on the I'm on the listserv and I've wanted to attend so many times. But alas, alas. Uh, Give the staff a break, for God's sake. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, Take I'll, care. I'll, Thank you, everybody. Write me, um, DM me, whatever, and I would love to love to have you join us on Wednesday when their staff meetings are taking place. Just the hell, you, you know. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Take care, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Back. Thank bye you. Bye. Take care. And um, uh, look, everybody who was on stack, please, uh, you know, take Jim up on writing him with a question or stick around for family time, bring it up for all of us. We'll be going to that soon. First of all, big thanks to Chuck Pinocchio for his uh, patience here. Chuck is going to be on in, in a few minutes. Right now, let's go to Mike Fox for our PDA to do's. And um, right at the top, let me say, please, everybody, um, please donate if you can to PDA. Um, we really come close to and oftentimes fall short of our goal. Uh, for fundraising on these calls. And um, so please, if you can, uh, throw a little money in to support our work on all of these fronts. Mike Fox, and then to Donna Smith to introduce Chuck Pinocchio. Mike. Yes, Alan. And thank you, Chuck. You rock. I'm so looking forward to hearing what you have to say about state by state uh, Medicare expanded and improved Medicare for all only state by state. Uh, let me do my favorite job and then we'll get right to uh, you, Alan. Uh, the thank yous. The following folks have donated Christine and John and Dr. Deutsch, phone banker Dr. Deutsch and phone banker Mary and Jean and Laura and phone banker Aaron, phone banker Betsy, Catherine, phone banker Erica, Denise, Dr. Deutsch again, thank you, sir, and Vicki and Dorothy as always. Thank you every week, sister and Bob and Maxine every week. Thank you, uh, Mac excuse me, Maxine and Russell. And phone banker Michael, phone banker Jane, and Michael Shapiro, who every week starts us off. Thank you, brother. We're still substantially short on goal, so please do hit that link that I just put into the chat. We'll discuss our other goals uh, when family start time starts. Folks on YouTube, you got to get on Zoom to get on family time. That's when the cool kids hang out. So uh, let's go back to you, Alan, and we'll look forward to more on goals uh, when we go into family time. Yeah, and when we get to family time today, while I do, I have uh, literal family obligations, and I really do need to be off at the top of the hour, but um, I will will return to some of the subjects too, and and I definitely, in, in, in hearing Jim's thoughts about, again, the issue of the, how we message from PDA and what gets said publicly about this issue, I have a few things that are just bouncing through my head, and I'll say uh, really reflective of uh, reflections on what, what Jim offered us today, too. So we'll have that coming up in family time. But right now, look, obviously, single payer universal health care, Medicare for all um, is a top priority for PDA and always has been. And um, we are in a, a situation right now where the reality is that um, you, you clearly need uh, an administration, a president, who will support that, who will say he will not veto it if it reaches his desk to really have a prospect of passing it at the federal level. Uh, obviously, the federal government doing this would be the gold standard we'd want to achieve. We understand the constraints on state budgets are stricter than they are at the federal level, et cetera, which could really allow the the, the program to be fully, fully formed at the federal level. But it can be fully formed at the state level. And there are many states with enough uh, revenue to be able to achieve it. And we now know that we're very unlikely to have a champion for Medicare for all at the presidency over the next five years. We need single-payer universal health care Medicare for all in this country right now, today. 
What goes on in this country in the healthcare system is outrageous. Um, it is criminal. Um, and it is, uh, to me, an abrogation of our, all of our human rights. So we, we need that. And the way to move it forward right now in the country and possibly to achieve it in a state and then have it spread like wildfire across the country, because it will be so much superior to the healthcare system as it exists in the country currently, is through the single payer movements in the states, not in any way to turn away from the effort to grow it nationally. And the lead the organizer of this movement for state wide single payer has been Chuck Pinocchio. And to introduce Chuck, I now pass the baton back to Donna Smith. Okay, thank you, uh, Alan, very much. And I want to do this very quickly because I want to get to Chuck. He's been waiting. Um, I first met Chuck Pinocchio in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 2007 when a Healthcare Now bus that was touring the country uh, pulled up to a progressive uh, meeting. And um, there were tables and tables lined up all throughout this hall. And there was uh, Medicare for all people. There was all sorts of different issues that were being addressed. And there who stood alone was Chuck Pinocchio, who was advocating for looking at whether or not we could go uh, on a state basis to single payer and Medicare for all. Um, I decided right then and there, this was a man I needed to have a friendship with and a relationship um, and organizing with. And we would run into each other a little while later at a PDA conference in Wayne, Pennsylvania in 2010. And we were very much the forming uh, organization PDA was to launch one payer states that day in Wayne, Pennsylvania. It was April 10th, 2010. And ever since that time, Chuck has been very diligent at keeping the organization One Pair of States going. I couldn't be more grateful. I haven't always been able to help Chuck as much as he deserves to have help with this, but it's a thriving organization. We have a lot of work to do, but there are many, many states in this country, including California, uh, which many of us think is an important linchpin to moving this forward. Um, the reality is Chuck is one of the people who's most devoted and um, he's always been so dear to me and so good to me. And he's a brilliant speaker, brilliant uh, at organizing. And, and with that, my friend, Chuck Pinocchio. Thank you, thank you so much, Donna. Uh, I'm so ever uh, eternally grateful for your friendship and guidance and wisdom and and uh, how we've marched together through the years. and. Um, um, so thank you for your inspiration and your story. And of course, that spun out of SICKO. And uh, we did that reunion, that fun reunion together in Philadelphia. And we when we had no air conditioning <laughs> in that church. And Michael informed that us. That was sure fun, wasn't it? Yeah. Michael informed us that, well, we actually have air conditioning in New York. It'll get to Philadelphia eventually. So anyway, <laughs> um, a lot of a lot of great stories over the years, and we've 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 really made a lot of progress. Um, a shout out to Alan, thank you, Alan, for bringing bringing me on. Uh, you know, we were talking while I was working the halls of Congress uh, 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 late last week. I was in Rayburn, and uh, I've I've knocked every Democratic door and every non MAGA Republican door. Uh, in Cannon House Office Building, Longworth House Office Building, and I have two floors to go in Rayburn. It's a very methodical process. It's very exhausting, to be honest with you. At the end mm -hmm. of the day, I am really wiped out because these are cold calls. I don't have time to set up appointments. They, they would take up the better part of a morning just to get a meeting together and, and so forth. So the first round of work that we're doing is really cold calls and getting SABUCA, which is short for State-Based Universal Healthcare Act, S-B-U-H-C-A, SABUCA, on the radar screen of members of Congress. We have a ton of educating for education work to do. But just to, to take the story back very quickly to where Donna was, the, the founding of, of One Pair of States uh, uh, over 2009, 2010, you recall that that was about the moment when the ACA uh, was being passed by the end of 2010. And, or mid 2010. And that took the oxygen out of the room for the conversation uh, with Democrats and Republicans. Um, but for the time period, though, from 2006 until 2009, 10, when I was executive director of Healthcare for All Pennsylvania, we were getting a lot of traction with a lot of Republicans in rural areas. And I and, and we were able to get breakthrough with the Republican uh, gatekeeper 
in Pennsylvania, in, in Harrisburg. This guy came out of the insurance industry and he chaired the insurance and banking industry. Uh, Don White's his name. And and all of the lobbyists, both on both sides of the aisle, said, you're never going to get a meeting with Don. He'll never give you a hearing. I guarantee it. Well, guess what? We got the meeting. I had to drive out to Indiana, Pennsylvania, the other end of the state. Uh, but he got we got the meeting and I sat down with him the first half hour. His chief of staff was just looking at his clock, his watch. And then Don said, you know what? You take the next meeting. I'm going to stay here and talk to Chuck. And for 45 minutes, we chewed on this issue. And he said, you make common sense. Single pair makes common sense. And when he told me his personal health care story, and this is really important, I think, for everybody to realize that everybody does have a health care story, no matter who they are several healthcare stories. And he told me that his goal was to get his daughter, who was a practicing intern at Christiana Hospital in Wilmington, back home to Indiana, Pennsylvania. He wanted his, his daughter back home with his grandchildren. That was his healthcare story. And so he went forward and gave us the first, and I believe only Republican chaired single payer hearing in the country to date. And so we know we can move mountains. And that's exactly what I'm working on with, with, with allies around the country. And we want you to join the work here at One Pair of States. Help, help with your uh, statewide, statewide health care for all organization. Work through One Pair of States. Inside, outside is the way we're going to win. And we've never, single payer has never had a permanent fixed single payer presence. And certainly One Pair of States is not until this year. I moved here on September 1st to Washington, D.C., I worked here 42 years ago. I was a I was a aide to Senator Alan Cranston, and that was before they threw up all the the barricades around the town. So it's very disorienting coming back here. But it's I figured out already in three weeks of lobbying what we can do to build a coalition to get this legislation to pass, which will provide the federal funds that states are going to need to bring back home. That's Medicare, Medicaid, chips. TRICARE, federal employee health care dollars, bring those dollars back home and create a single payer pool, which allows for the efficiency to actually deliver universal health care. I can see it. I can taste it. We have the strategy to get this done. We just need more people to put their shoulder to the wheel and provide pre uh, pressure on the outside to contact your members of Congress to support uh, the state-based universal health care act. Where we are right now is we know we're not going to get hearings. The Republicans are in charge. We're building a three-year campaign. And it's based on the premise that the Democrats take back the House, hold on to the Senate, hold on to the, on the White House. And this is how we could do it in different tranches. And I, I wish I could turn my, I, my screen around and show you the 300 and plus cards, business cards that have got lined up is what we're doing is we're building tranches of people who supported who support Pramila's National Medicare for All bill. That's a tranche of about 118 members of Congress. That's about half the Democratic delegation. The other half of the Democratic delegation is broken between roughly people who support the public option and those, especially in, in red states, who support expanding Medicare, or excuse me, Medicaid expansion. Those are the That's the Democratic constituency that I have to patch together, that we have to patch together to get us close to 50%. But we're going to need, I believe, to bring in some Republicans as well. And I've got about 10 of them on my radar screen. We've got great advances already with folks up in Oregon. My former member, Brian Fitzpatrick in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, is very doable and a handful of others. So we've got a winning strategy. It's convincing them that they should give states the opportunity to innovate a universal health care model. For some of them, they want to see it done through the public option. And I'm not even going to argue with them in Congress. It's There's no point. We want their vote to get this legislation. Once we get that vote, then we know confidently that the single payer legislation in California, Oregon, Washington, Minnesota, Maine, and New York, among others, is going to get that, that push that it needs with the federal funding, again, coming back to the states. In addition, the legislation provides an ERISA waiver. Uh, for those of you not familiar, it was a 1974 law of Congress, Employee Retirement Income Security Act. Basically, it says state government cannot regulate benefit programs from private employers. We get a we get a uh, legal waiver, and it will require that the employers be part of the one payer pool or the single payer pool at the state level. So, I we, we can see how we get this done. We've got vision. We've got a strategy. We're building relationships. And we're developing nuanced communications that will very intentionally listen to what it is that the member of Congress will find acceptable to move forward the state-based universal health care legislation that Ro Khanna will be introducing, likely on November 9th or 10th. So what that means is that this, this coming week, the next week, 
is our best opportunity to get onto the legislation, what are called original co-sponsors, right? These are the folks who, if they sign on before the bill is formally introduced by Ro Khanna on November 9 or 10 with the number publicly, if we get them to sign on beforehand, their name will appear at the top of the legislation. Those are known as original co-sponsors. We want to get as, as many original co-sponsors as possible, similar to the National Medicare for All campaign that got more than 110 on originally and have picked up, I think, about eight or 10 more since then. You should know, please, that Pramila Jaya, Paul, was the primary author of this legislation before Ro Khanna. She believes in the state-based effort. She believes in this track and has told me personally that she believes this is the more likely scenario that we're going to get to national single payer, is to model it at the state level. And you don't have to ask me. Ask the ghost of Tommy Douglas. The ghost of Tommy Douglas will tell you that Saskatchewan was the way that Canada was able to get to single payer. They modeled single payer in Canada, in Saskatchewan. And Tommy Douglas is now regarded as the greatest Canadian in their history because of what he was able to do in the province of Saskatchewan. Once he modeled it there, all the other provinces out of jealousy said, we want a piece of that because it helps your economy. It gets health, comprehensive health care to everyone. It, it actually generates jobs. It creates economic stability. It provides, it, it, it draws in uh, 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 medical professionals who are gonna wanna practice in a system that is administratively non-burdensome. There are a hundred different reasons why we want and need single payer, but the point is, is that this pathway through the states, I believe, and I'm saying this from the perspective of, of a political historian, somebody with a, a doctor who taught 32 years in the classroom, is that if you look at the progressive era, the progressive era began with, with reforms in the city of Milwaukee, then it went to Wisconsin, then it went national under TR. Same thing with, with uh, Franklin Roosevelt. All the New Deal reforms started in Albany at the state level in New York. This is actually a tradition in American history. This is our history. And frankly, it is the structure of our of our of our constitution, our federal constitution, where power is at least theoretically divided between the states and the nation. And right now, the way the power is arrayed with the medical industrial complex in Washington, DC, I'm convinced that the states right now are the pathway, that the path of least resistance is adopting programs in, again, Oregon, in Washington, California, Minnesota, Maine, and New York, among others. Um, so that's that's basically my wrap for the day. I just wanted to let folks know that we've got a plan and it's, it's a strategy that's built on, it's a 16 point strategy that's built on visioning the success, actually seeing the success, and then doing reverse engineering and saying, how did we get there? How did we get there? What did we do in terms of communication strategy? What did we do in terms of our own self-awareness? Other awareness. Did we do the research on this member? Do we know what, what uh, uh, Open Secrets told us about the money that they take from the various medical industrial lobbies? Did we really do our homework? Did we sit down and listen to these members, work our way up the food chain? It's very methodical. It's very labor intensive, but I'm absolutely convinced that this is the this is the best path and the quickest path that we're going to get to national Medicare for all. So, Alan, or I don't know if you're still with us or oh, Mike. I'm still with us. I'm still yeah, with yeah, you. Yeah. And yeah. I have something to add on. So, OK, so Please. in the next week and then after the bill gets introduced, first of all, we have a great working relationship with Ro Khanna's office. And I got to get in touch with their alleged director on something else this week. Um, so um, back to tomorrow. Uh, but our, we have this program, the Congressional Liaison Program. And maybe even tomorrow, Chuck, um, we will, if you want to send us the targeted, um, a set of targeted Congress people, then Danette and I can reach out to our liaisons in those districts and they can uh, call their offices. And, um, and you know, say we're representing PDA with 250 members in your district and we support you signing on to the Rokana bill. So we can try to work over the next week. And uh, I suppose it'll be myself and Danette from the liaison program assisting you in that. So PDA is committed to that in the next week to get original co-sponsors and then work afterwards to get more support as you continue to work to build support for this in this Congress. Um, but I agree that the co-sponsors, especially in a, in a time when you're not going to get hearings because of Republican control is key. So let's see what we can do in the next week. And, um, you know, if you, anytime you want to send uh, me and, and I'll pass it on to Danette, um, the list of offices that you're going to target, to try to get on as original co-sponsors, and we can reach out to, first of all, we can just follow up ourselves with a note 
to those offices, and then we can get our liaisons in district to uh, signal their support for this. Right. So we'll try to work on that over the next week. That's, um, so that, that's, that's the. Yeah. That's great. And also, I should mention before I lose track is uh, we are also looking around for a U.S. senator to carry the bill, similar to the way that Pramila and Bernie do a two step, you know, on the national Medicare for all. And we do have a number of leads. I don't want to throw out names because that could be compromise our, our efforts. But nonetheless, we are conscious and, 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 and confident we're going to get a senator. And that may very well lead to hearing since the Democrats are in the majority on that in that uh, chamber. Is your sense that it would be a bill that would be available for reconciliation because of its level of, of budget uh, focus? We had that conversation with Alex Lawson over at Social Security Works, one of our partners in this work. Um, and 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 I should also mention, too, that, you know, along those lines that we have a massive list of organizations, national, state and local, uh, that have endorsed uh, this legislation, the State Based Universal Health Care Act. So we do have good grassroots, um, but it's not covering all of the country. So, Alan, PDA's work is going to be absolutely crucial here. So thank you for that. Oh, yeah. Um, well, we're thrilled. And, we're, we're thrilled. Thank you, man, because that's this is this is our. This is our bread and butter. It's what keeps our blood flowing through our veins is support. You know, we, we got to drive for this. And in this situation, Republican control of the House, Biden, a non-supporter at the federal level in the White House, this is going to fuel what we're all about. So thank you to you. And we're excited to work with you on it. So excited. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank thanks. you, Chuck, so much. Thank you, Donna. And yeah. then we can take questions, too, for Chuck, if people haven't. I see Ira, our brilliant, uh, uh, one of our brilliant messengers in PDA who translates our national letters into Republican speak uh, quite often. So, Ira, your question for Chuck, your question or comment, please unmute. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm. Uh, Alan, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's exactly what I want. The issue I wanted to raise right now is that I got uh, Chuck. I got the the, the OPS um, uh, email with something to click on to send a message to my Congress member, right. and I did so. Uh, but uh, I changed it. I added in front of it, uh, in, in front of the brief message, I said support states' rights. Because I live in Texas with with a Republican uh, Congress member, unfortunately, <clears throat> and so I wanted to urge you to have you talk about an inside outside strategy. I also suggest that you have an, a left right strategy, where to Republican Congress members, you start out with that message: support states' rights. Then you can say anything you want about about single payer. Uh, about uh, you know state based, which I think is great stuff, but start out with that theme. I'm going to shut up because otherwise I'll get on my soapbox. Yeah, yeah. Thank thank, you, thanks for that, Ira. I mean, I, I can tell you though, with Republicans, do not use the term single payer. It's a trigger. It's an absolute trigger. You don't want to use that term. What, whatever right? t whatever term you use, what I'm suggesting yeah. is is that you flip the the framing to support states' rights. Yeah. And I'm going to interject gonna something, Ira and Chuck, I want to interject. I don't know if folks remember, during the debates on the ACA, uh, Dennis Kucinich in committee actually did get an amendment passed that would have allowed states to go forward. And Ira, it was exactly that strategy, that the Republicans couldn't keep themselves from voting for something that seemed like a state's right. And we had enough Democrats that went for it. So it's brilliant to do that. It's important to do that. It's not being dishonest. It's just playing to the right audience. Thank you for bringing that up. But I don't know how many people know that history. Nancy Pelosi stripped it out of the ACA before it went to vote. Yeah, this is actually an effort to bring that idea back in. That's really what Sabuka is. And it would it would be uh, uh, Amendment 1335 to the Affordable Care Act. This is actually an amendment to the existing Affordable Care Act. And it would do things that the original amendment that addressed states, 1332, that said that you can innovate at the state level after July 1 or after January 1, 2017. But it doesn't it's not specific about what those federal dollars would be and the ERISA waiver. So that's this le this legislation is explicit to make sure that the states get what they need to have the best opportunity to implement single payer at the state level. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. And thanks, Ira. Um, Rick LaMonica, uh, your uh, questions or comments, please. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask Chuck Panaccio, I should be able to know, pronounce that being a 
Italian American myself, but I didn't catch what if you're in DC or where where's <laughs> one state one pair state uh, actually headquartered or whatever you would call that. Yeah. <laughs> With so much stuff like PDA that are virtual. Um if we could ever get you to Missouri, St. Louis, uh I don't think Missouri will ever pass that single payer state thing because we're run by Trump Trumpites before the word Trump. And but Illinois might uh being a lot more progressive and having a much stronger PDA and PNHP chapter in on those states plus the PNHP headquarters. Uh, so uh do you actually have time to travel around the country or even do a Zoom presentation that we could use at a meeting? Oh, absolutely. We can do Zoom. I'm, I'll, I'll tell you. So I moved to Washington, D.C. I am here. I'm in Columbia Heights, if you know the city at all. I'm above Adams Morgan. It's a 20 minute ride into the Capitol. Boom, boom. It's really very quick. And, um, oh. you know, I, so so uh, I also sold my car. There was no point in having a car when you got public transit. That's for sure. So I'm not mobile in terms of uh, driving. I mean, I potentially could fly, but, you know, know that I'm a volunteer. And then I'm living on an early social security check. I don't mind telling you that. And I've got my own health issues. I mean, I'm going to, I want this to be real. I want this conversation for you to know we all have stories and I'm not going to be a, you know, just a sort of a, a, a face for you, but we all have stories and we all have motivations. And I've been doing this work for five decades, social justice work. And it's, it, it really is coming in handy to be able to go into Barbara Lee's office and say, hey, I used to be a military case worker for Ron Dellums. Hey, you go, I used to go, I went to high school in San Diego. Hey, I grew up in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, connect. So, I mean, your personal stories and your connections and the geography and your, in your history is really, really powerful. I really feel like I've arrived at a, at a magic moment in my life and it's a gift to be able to talk to these members and especially the young legislative aides, you know, so you don't know if you're going into the office or you're going to get to the intern, the legislative correspondent, the legislative aide, the legislative director or the chief of staff, you know, how, how, how high am I going to climb the food chain? And you have to sort of tailor your message to who you're talking to, to whom you're talking to, and also to connect story, right? You know, uh, Lloyd Doggett, I worked on his president, his uh, Senate campaign in 1984 and, Texas. Great. So, you know, points that, that really help to bring home and make it more personal and more memorable. And so I'm going to be spending the next two years having coffees and lunches with all these people and making sure that they understand and are educated up on what this legislation does and how it matches up our own history of change and how Canada got to single pair. Thank you. Wow. Uh, I have to say, too, by the way, when you were talking earlier, including with what you just said, um, I would just say to the audience, your distillation of um, the sort of the terrain of the congressional offices and how to build support for legislation and what the necessary ingredients are struck me as about as spot on a distillation of the process. We really should just package it and send it out to civics courses across the country. Um, so it is absolutely brilliant for us to, uh, as PDA, to have such a strong ally now up on the Hill. Um, a process that, yes, there are paid for lobbyists, citizens lobbying, volunteer driven lobbying, the very uh, you know, supposedly a lifeblood of our democracy in representative democracy is so atrophied in this country. So what Chuck is doing is so exemplary and it's exactly what we want to be hitting our marks on, on our congressional liaison program. And it's all about all of us as citizens taking back our government from paid lobbyists. Let's go to Alex and then Jeffrey. Alex in his car today. Welcome, Alex Williams. If you can unmute, Alex. Can you hear me now? Yep, and be safe if you're driving. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I'm not driving. I'm parked. Oh, cool. cool, cool. I <laughs> mean, um, I, I got an uh, I got a uh, electric car, and I got to charge it. I'm at the Chevy dealer. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Hmm. Um. When he said about single payer statewide, I mean, going state by state, I thought that was a brilliant idea. I thought about it years ago, and I'm thinking. Um. And I know exactly where he's talking about Columbia High. I'm in I'm in Rockville, Maryland right now. And um, so I know where he's talking about. And uh, is there a way I had a, I had a thought about getting like here in the metropolitan Washington area, DMV, you know, maybe the district gets a plan and then Maryland gets a plan and Virginia gets a plan. And, or you could extend it up the East Coast to Delaware, Pennsylvania. And uh, the states kind of join together. 
And then, like he said, if other states see that, they'll want to join in, and then eventually it's nationwide. Oh, what about that? Interesting question. <clears throat> Your thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Let's talk offline. Is Alan is there a place so I can drop my email and a and a couple links? Uh, yeah, can I do that? Chat, if you're in the chat, and just make sure it's being sent to everyone, not to the staff or to any one person. I'm not sure I'm seeing a chat. I see something that says more 99% or 99 plus. Is that the chat right there? Well, I'm not sure your interface. Uh, it's usually Show chat preview. Oh, yeah, it's under more. And then if you, you should have it. Oh. So, yeah. The, yeah. It used to be uh, on the bar on, on Zoom. Now you usually have to click on more to find the chat. Got it. Okay, cool. I'll yeah. I'll drop my email and uh, the links that people uh, were talking about uh, to you can lobby through our software system. It's uh, one click politics, uh, and also encourage people to write directly, uh, and then and then you know meet folks back at home back home in the in the. Uh, uh, in the district offices as well. So hit them at all levels for sure. Everybody probably has, I mean, I have had this num phone number imprinted on my brain since I worked on Capitol Hill back in 1982, 202-224-3121, right? That's Capitol Hill switchboard, 202-224-3121. Mm -hmm. That's the shortcut. Um, but please, yeah, th this coming week is really important for getting up, picking up original co-sponsors. And I'll drop some stuff in the in the chat. Thanks, Alan. And, and just a, just the idea that Alex shared about. I, I mean, I, I imagine it's, it's difficult because the states are set up with their own budgeting, but to set up a regional um, um, a regional uh, set of states that we're sharing in a single payer plan is certainly in, something that might be easier in other in other provincial and state structures in other countries. But it's not impossible to conceive in the United States, but it strikes me as difficult. Is that your sense, Chuck? Yeah. Well, that language is explicit to Gro Khanna's rewrite of this legislation. I mean, he actually gives authorization explicit for regional compacts okay. to work. There, there we and, go. And we're modeling state collaboration as we speak between Oregon and Washington and California. I mean, legislators wow. and activists are all talking to each other. You know, the, the idea of building a blue wall on the West Coast from Canada to Mexico, a single pair blue wall, the idea and bring in Nevada, bring in Colorado, bring in Hawaii, you know, and just build, build, build out that way. Um, I don't, we're not going to have to we're not going to it's not going to take, you know, 30, 40 states to do this. I think once we get three, four or five of them doing it, I think the rest of the country is going to wake the heck up. Oh, heck um, geez. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um. Uh, you know, it's like it's like a it's like a free public university system too. It'll be a magnet for people coming into states, moving in, creating more dynamic economies. I mean, not not flooding the states with population, but it's going to be so attractive, and it's going to hurt other states because of the drain out of those states into the states that have this. I mean, it's such a huge issue in people's lives. Jeffrey is up next, and then Carla and Sue will keep going. As well, as, well let's try to go another ten minutes or so with Chuck. Carla, you, oh sorry, uh, up now is uh, uh, Jeffrey, then Carla. Are you on unmuted, Jeffrey? Hmm. Um, yeah, let's go to Carla, then back to Jeffrey. Carla, you're up. Please unmute. Yes, I'd like to ask the speaker if he, he has been in contact with Senator John Marty in Minnesota, who has, we have our own plan, and he has a book published on his plan. And you mentioned Minnesota, so I'm curious what uh, Senator Marty is saying to you about this one pair legislation you're mentioning oh fair question good question i know john i love john uh we spent a good chunk of time he was our featured speaker when we did a one pair states breakout with a with the national medicare for all strategy meeting i want to say back in 2018 19 right in there we went into minneapolis and saw all those uh uh, those those pianos uh, dedicated to uh, Prince on the streets of Minneapolis. Um, but but John, uh, I spoke to him, I want to say 10 days, two weeks ago. And uh, straight up, he's concerned that this legislation might be used as an excuse for state level politicians to oppose state level single payer. I'm being honest with you, that's his position right now. And uh, after 45 minutes of him on the phone, he said, no, I think I think you make a lot more sense. So I think we I, just in that short conversation I had with John, I think I moved him to the idea. Look, look every politician's going to look for an excuse not to do anything anyway, John. I mean, and he's been doing this for more than 30 years, right? Running this single pair bill in Minneapolis. He's one of our great champions. And so John is very important, I think, in our movement uh, as somebody who's on the front lines and has been doing this for so long. 
But this legislation is really designed to make, make it easier for a single payer to pass at the state level, not harder. That's the design. Now, politicians, again, are going to do what they want to do for whatever set of reasons they have. And we can't control that. But what we can control is the movement of states that are ready to move forward. And that's really what this is about, ultimately. Um, we're going to get Minnesota over the top. But it may it may mean that we start with Oregon and Washington first. Um, but I, I'm going to talk to John again this week and just see where he where his temperature is is right now we it still need to get ilhan omar on the bill by the way you know as low a hanging fruit as there is we got to get cory bush we got to get barbara lee i mean we've got 15 folks on board all the oregon delegation half the washington delegation we got to do a bunch of work in california new york and elsewhere so this is really why i'm asking folks today to roll up your sleeves all odds are your members not on and you're going to make a huge difference so i've got we got a lot of work to do thank you so much appreciate the call yeah, and then Jeffrey, you're next. With the, so, so what he's speculating on is that politicians will use this to signal to try to get money from the healthcare industry or something, or whatever their motivations may be. Or I don't know. I think it, I think John's speaking from a understandably from a position of frustration. I'd be frustrated as hell as well if I had to deal with the with, with what he's dealt with for three decades. I totally get it. Well, you saw you saw what we what happened out here in California last time. Yeah, last, yeah, this, yeah. Uh, Look, my 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 organizing mantra is radical hospitality, radical hope, and radical love, and that really means entertaining the conversation, listening to people, and really working at it, and setting your cynicism at the door if you have that. I mean, cynicism is a negativity that I've I've checked out of a long time ago. And I had a transfer a life transformational experience of five years ago. I'm just telling you, I went into depression. I came out on the other side. I, I think you froze Chuck. five years and ever before. Oh, you, you froze there for a second. Um, but um, I, I'll say this when, when when what happens in California last time, from my point of view, it was just a matter of, um, uh, you know, these two channels that are being uh, pursued uh, by two allied groups with PDA uh, broadly understood. And for us, we just support both and we keep going forward. And when the thing fell apart where it fell apart on the one front last year, I don't want to go into the details. Um, a lot of people sort of blew up about it. And it's, to me, it's just a, a live and learn. You know, you, you see the experience. You don't want to have it happen again. And you but you learn from it because it's happening and you go forward because, you know, it's just the maintenance of the current healthcare system in the United States, the way it is. And by the way, it's only getting worse, folks. Um, we've all seen that with the expansion of the privatization into Medicare in recent years, which PDA has been very active on. Um, you can never get too dismayed. And Chuck, you're absolutely spot on right. And for us, we just pick up and we go and we stick to our guns. Jeffrey, you're up and then Sue. Jeffrey, you're unmuted, I believe. Okay. Um, what I what I had my assembly person told me that there was 40 assembly people in California that were against single payer. So what I turned around and took is from the last time we did this in Kara, um, Kara and everything else did not get the votes. Uh, we turned around and I turned around and directed to those people that the own national, or should we say the California legislative office determined that if we do nothing, it's going to cost another $500 billion. So going after those individuals that are against single payer and asking them what they proposed has been very enlightening in conversation and get in there. And I hope we do something more with the SB 770 to get going after these waivers in California. And that's what I'm going to say right now is what's going on. Just Work through it. Go after the people that you need and find out what their viewpoints are. Conversations Thank help. Absolutely. Thank you. And uh, let's just go right to Sue, Sue Weisner, who I, I got your, your question in from the chat last time, Sue. So take now. now it's, I'm uh, mute. Sue, can you hear me? Can you we hear can me? Hear you. Yep, we can hear you, Sue. Okay, so I got to press something. Okay. Um. First of all, Anna Kaplan in New York. If you know Anna Kaplan. She's running for some position here in Great Neck, and she reneged on single payer. Long Island progressives, which were Ron Widerleck, you know Ron Widerleck? He um, was a Bernie delegate. He got her to agree to single payer, and she reneged on it. She's running again against George Santos, and um, we have to put pressure on her to stick to single payer. Second thing, this might get some people upset. I have dual Israeli American citizenship. And my um, friends who I chant with, I'm a Buddhist, they, we started chanting and she said, 
I got to get off the phone. There's a bomb. She had to run out of her house. There was a bomb. Uh, then my other relatives who live in Tel Aviv are scared to death. So the Israelis are suffering too, not only the Palestinians. Oh, we understand. And the reason, and the, I know, but it's, I only yeah. see free Palestine. I don't see, oh. how about, how about, you know, Israel having a decent government, you know? Um, what, what I'm saying is about the ceasefire. Bernie, they're blaming Bernie that he didn't support a ceasefire. I kind of think he did. He said a pause. But when I lived in Israel, anytime there was negotiations, there'd be bombs, there'd be bombs in the shuk, in the market. So I'm afraid, theoretically, I want to see, I definitely want to cease fire in Ukraine. But I'm afraid if there's, I'm wary that if there's a ceasefire in Israel, Palestine, that'll give a chance for the Hamas and Israelis to rearm. And it'll be worse. So that's why mm. I don't blame Bernie. I think he really knows what he's talking about. He went to the border in Gaza in 2018 or something to support those who are, you know, the Palestinians are trying to breach the border. I really think he knows he's talking about. So I'd like briefly your thoughts on this. Okay. Um, and I apologize, Chuck. And I, Mike, I saw your comment. And, but just in, in respect to you, Sue, first of all, we are, the way that I want to start framing this issue, and it, I, I have very complex thoughts on this, and it's probably better for me not to just say things off the top of my head. But on the focus point, we want to return all the way back to the prospects of a world in which Israelis don't live in fear and Palestinians don't live in fear. I think um, what is ongoing right now in no way adds up to that. And um, I don't think uh, in <laughs> a ceasefire versus a pause, one is done obviously with the intention of bringing people into negotiations because you're stopping it. It doesn't return again in two days. Um, and if it returns back to the current ante, I, again, I, I do believe in my heart that Israeli government policy towards the Palestinian, the Palestinians and the level of violence that is inflicted on Gaza as in the current situation um, is not protective of the lives and welfare of people in Israel over the arc of time. Uh, and of course, I would want to see a world where Obviously, I'm Jewish self-identified, and I don't want to see anybody in the world have to live in fear or suffer suffer damage. But am I attentive, of course, to um, to that occurring to Jews around the world? I especially am. And I am focused on what I believe to be policies that will limit uh, the anti-Semitism in the world, violence against Jews everywhere, and violence against everywhere, everyone in the world. And I certainly, because of the... Um, to join fates of the Israeli and the Palestinians, I also have a very heightened sense of that for Palestinians as well, because I think in turn that reflects back on the safety of everyone in the region for both groups. So, uh, yeah. So we'll differ on the word ceasefire, but I really do appreciate your voice here, Sue. And I, I do, P please continue to speak out and, and challenge us if you see nuanced differences that we have. Um, you're, 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 on, you're back to muted because that's the default after you start speaking. If you can just unmute, and then we'll go back to Chuck. Oh, we have to ask you to unmute, it says. Oh, boy. Sorry about this. 21st century problems here. Um, um, while we're on this, by the way, Chuck, um, one of the people in our chat um, recommended Tammy Baldwin as a possible um uh, Senate, and I do think that's actually an interesting match and a possibility. Sue, you're you're unmuted. Just in one more minute, then let's get back to Chuck. Uh, Sue, you're unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I agree with Free Palestine. There's the slogan Free Palestine. How about having a slogan Get rid of Netanyahu because they hate Netanyahu. Mm -hmm. So it should not only be Free Palestine; it should be free, <laughs> free whatever it is, Israel. I don't even like the word Israel, but. Just why is it only on one side? Why is it only for you, Palestine? I mean, they, they've suffered. Okay, but Israelis have suffered. Uh, Jews have suffered. And so the um the Holocaust, oh, Mike is saying it's not. I'm just saying it shouldn't be one-sided. The Palestinians are suffering the most now. But they did come in a, a musical festival and kill everybody and kill mm -hmm. people I know. And that's what we're doing. It's not going to condemn them. We should condemn uh, the Israeli government, but we should also condemn Hamas. Hamas. I agree, I agree with condemning Hamas on that fully. 
But thank you, Sue. And we should go back to Chuck. And I appreciate your thoughts. And let's stay in dialogue. I appreciate it so much. Um, sorry, Chuck, for the interruption. Um, Bonnie Morris is next. Please unmute, Bonnie. Hi, Chuck. Um, hey, Bonnie. I, uh, hello? Yep, I got you. Oh, okay. I'm trying to get my video on, but maybe that's not that important. Anyways, um, Chuck, I remember that you uh, presented at the, um, I'm from Seattle, and uh, I remember you presented at the Physicians for National Health um, in, of, of Washington. And so I think, so you're pretty familiar with what's going on in Washington State with our uh, Universal Health Care Commission, which yes. um, I and a number of the people that I am activists with have worked um, on getting that bill passed and getting the commission. Um, right now, I feel like we're at a stalemate. I don't, I'm not sure if you're kind of familiar with what's going on in Washington right now, but um, the commissioners, uh, the commission meetings oftentimes aren't fully attended. Um, what's happening is they keep rediscussing the same things over and say, if, oh, we can't figure this out until we do this, but then we can't do this thing. Um, uh, we've had some movement in that um, whole Washington, you know, presented their plan and uh, they may be looking at that as a uh, funding, you know, as a, a model. But I was just wondering if you could um, give me some feedback on what you think might set kind of some fire under <laughs> the commission right now. You know, um, our group, uh, Healthcare is a Human Right, we're going to every meeting and, and meeting before and after the meeting and provided pointed um, feedback, uh, public comment, but it doesn't seem to be working real well. Yeah, I, I think there are, uh, there are at least there are at least two key components here, and I would argue that there are several that need to be added to the mix in terms of building out a winning strategy uh, in Washington state and, and any state for that matter. And that is um, in Washington state in particular, the single pair legislative leaders uh, are, not, are, are no longer around. Um, you, you, they, they, they didn't run for reelection or they were defeated in a primary, as I understand it. And so right now in Washington state, you're looking for new legislative leaders uh, in both the Senate and the assembly. I think that's part of it. The other is there's a, there is a hesitancy in organized labor and know that I'm a, a labor organizer. I'm a member of AFT. Um, I, I organized uh, my faculty in, in uh, University of the Arts in, in, uh, in Philadelphia and, and we won, we won our labor union. And um, so I'm all in with labor. But there's there's a hesitancy among labor union unionites uh, to support state based because of certain complications having to do with um, uh, how they would be receiving benefits and what they would have felt feel that they would have sacrificed for having gotten the health benefits that they do. It's a longer story, a longer conversation. It might, might be even beneficial to bring in Rose Roach at some point or Mark and or Mark Dudzig to talk about specifically labor's role in getting us to single payer. I think that's a really important conversation. And, but the other component in Washington, again, is getting is having your legislative leaders. And I also think building out constituent relationships with other groups that have been largely not paid attention to as much. And here I throw it down for PDA because you are doing the work to do outreach to disabilities. I was on the call the other night uh, with Debbie Dink, Debbie Dingle. And I think that's brilliant. That work is really, really important. The disabilities community, it's actually the largest uh, adversely affected constituency in the world, people with disabilities. And we just sort of take it for granted, but we have to be very conscious here. And the other community that we're working on building with is uh, at, at One Pair of States is veterans. Veterans and their, and their immediate family makers make up roughly 15% of the U.S. population, 15%. And that's a constituency that members of Congress are going to listen to first or second, right up there with business. Veterans have the ear of legislators. 
unfortunately, unlike, you know, activists, so to speak, you know, um, we're not taken quite as seriously. But veterans, I think, are a really key component. Labor has got to be brought more comfortably on board in, into the fight. And we also do need to win over significant chunks of the business community. And we're doing that work with our good friend, Wendell Potter, um, somebody that uh, Donna and I know very well. Um, so, so, th so those are just a few thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. And um, uh, let's go now to Tom Kriegel, who is uh, from the state of Wisconsin. Welcome, Tom. Uh, thank you. Um, what I what I have to say, you probably already know, but I'll say it anyways. Um, unfortunately, Wisconsin is not nearly as progressive as it was prior to 2010. But despite that fact, Tammy Baldwin, our senator, our our one good senator, um, has you know shown a lifelong interest in health care and uh, expanding health care. She is up for re-election soon, so that may influence her willingness to take risks, et cetera. But thankfully, um, in the last couple of years, the states of Illinois and Michigan have become very progressive with progressive governors and legislators, and uh, they've passed some amazing legislation in the last year. And the state of Minnesota has remained quite um, progressive as well. So hopefully uh, those three states can form a block that would advance this cause. So that's mainly what I wanted to say is that here's another block that there's some potential. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. And we have reached out to Tammy Baldwin, by the way. She does have a history on health care. She is up for re-election in 2024. I think there probably is a basic hesitancy there. And we've been working through our good friend, Jim Rich. I don't know if you know Jim Rich, W-R-I- CH. Um, he's been longtime active with, with One Pair of States. Maybe you can connect or I can connect the two of you because we do need to build out. Um, but part of the problem in Wisconsin is we're looking what we're looking at in, New, in, in uh, North Carolina is extreme gerrymandering, right. really denying Democrats their any even approaching uh, level of, of uh, numbers and representation. So Wisconsin is, a, is, you know, that's where the progressive era originated. Darn it. <laughs> you know, we got to get Wisconsin back on board. But you do have uh, a majority on the on the Supreme Court, which was an extraordinary election earlier this year. So there's good news there. And um, so let's stay in touch. I keep dropping my email address in the box and also the one click politics link so that you can lobby people through our, 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 our uh, software as well as the Capitol Hill switchboard. Thanks so much. I appreciate your thoughts. OK, so we're at the top of the hour and Gary is on deck because he has uh, been I can't I can't not let Gary speak. So Gary's going to go because he's in Berlin and he was on the last person to go last time when we we cut off the stack. Then we're going to chuck final thoughts. We're going to wrap the town hall on YouTube and we're going to go to family time. And everybody should stick around for family time if they can, because we'll just continue the conversation. Gary, you're up. All right. Hey, Alan, thanks so much. And thanks so much for having uh, Zogby as your as your mm -hmm. primary uh, guest. I was just interested, um, Chuck, have you calculated uh, I, in the best of all possible worlds how many full time organizers you would need in the next year? to have a, or in the next two years to have a realistic chance of, of winning? On, on the ground here in DC or nationally? Nationally. I, we just, and know, how much that would, how much that would cost? Yeah. So, I mean, our, our working budget for the coming year is $20,000 and know that I'm not being paid for this work. Um, right. We're all volunteers, um, but we are bringing in some, some we are committing some resources to social media travel yeah yeah but i mean if you could have you know someone sure. a multi a billionaire uh, who d doesn't like to waste his time looking at anything less than a five million dollar request right um what how many organizers would you need to have a realistic chance of winning at giving them like basic living expenses wages like forty thousand a year i think i could do it with three organizers Seriously. I mean, the nuclear freeze, civil rights movement, the anti-war uh, Vietnam yeah, yeah. War movement, um, they all took at least 1, 1,500 organizers each. Um, so three doesn't sound very realistic, to be frank. Well, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm going to chime in on here. You know, this goes to what I said earlier at the top of the show about one of the things that's happened is we've seen um, the the shrinking of a lot of the organizations that um, in recent times in the progressive movement have been paying these sort of like upper middle class wages for, for activists. And 
and then they lose a few funders and they have to cut half their staff and then they're gone. And um, it's sort of where we are right now uh, in the progressive movement. And I think PDA is proven very resilient as opposed to some organizations that are either just teetering right now into near disappearance or they've already gone away um, uh, um, or they're one third the size they were only four years ago because uh, we do approach it with, we really trying to have a frontline organizational uh, message that we we need equal volunteers, everybody equal, but the American tradition of civic engagement and volunteer engagement. And what Chuck is doing is certainly exemplary. That doesn't mean we don't need money or that, that one pair of states doesn't need money too. But um, right now, um, I actually believe that, again, trying to capture the imagination of the public is probably our best gambit for achieving this anyway. And then um, and on the ground activists, um, I mean, they're, they're very important, but until the pools of money come, we just have to organize them as volunteers. And uh, they'll understand the money that they'll save by having single payer health care in their states. So, yeah. Gary, you're, you're muted. Let's see. Oh. You, need, you, don't, you need to unmute. Oh, the, reason, the reason I asked is that uh, I'm trying trying to create an, uh, something that would be much better than GoFundMe that would basically enable um, people that work in these coffee shops, work in fast food places. There's 500,000 people that work in these kind of meaningless, low-paid jobs. If even 1% of those people had a quick way to crowdfund what they need, for basic living expenses, including people that might want to donate a room or a couch to cover their their rent, uh, just one percent of those people is five thousand organizers. So I'm going to send you that proposal and see if it's something you'd be interested in. Thank you. Um, my email is alan at pdamerica dot org. Uh, Chuck has put his in the uh, chat too. Yeah. So and thank you. Can, yeah. And I, and just I mean our my our theory of change here, at least my thinking on this, is that we we are going to need to mobilize. In my view. Given the the um, the oligarchy, the billionaire funded fascist uh, assembly of 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 of, uh, of 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 individuals who are either in it or enabling it, uh, we're going to need somewhere in the neighborhood, I believe, seven eight percent of mobilizing the population. We've got hundreds and thousands of volunteers across the country. It's getting them mobilized and really believing in this vision. I think that's really critical, and it and it complements what what Alan just said. But Gary, let's keep talking. And 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 Berlin is my second home, by the way. I I uh, you know I think I think I think everyone should adopt you know John F Kennedy's phrase "Ich bin ein Berliner," which is to say <laughs> Berlin can teach the world can teach the world what we need to understand here. You know, looking at the comparison of the Weimar Republic going into National Socialism and where we are. Our, our our teetering republic going into potentially a a, a fascist model of, of governance and certainly the new speaker of the house uh, certainly speaks to that anyway thank you so much gary keep in touch and before we shut down the recording remind people the name of the bill that rokana and that nifty acronym you've come up for with it yeah for. right so it's sabuka s-b-u-h-c-a as i'm typing it mm -hmm. which translates to state uh based universal health care act so we break up the health care it's two words health care act of 2023 and the bill is not officially out yet it doesn't have a number it's not been released it's not public but if you want a reference to let to language Go back to H.R. 3775 from the last session. Um, you could just do a quick Google on that. SBUHC, state-based, H.R. 3775. You'll get the language. But know that the, that the Kana has added a new phrase in this new bill, um, and, it, and it specifically embraces as core health care needs, reproductive rights, uh, gender-affirming care, uh, and disability uh, 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 services. So that language is very specific in this legislation, but the design of the bill is to enable, it's to enable the states, not to direct the states, but to enable the states based on requirements that they are going to reach certain thresholds to achieve universal health care. But just check, check out the bill, write me an email, I'll send you some talking points 
Um, and again, roll up your sleeves, help me out, help us out, get this thing uh, introduced with as many original co-sponsors as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chuck Panacchio. And that's Chuck Panacchio. When he says help us out, that is PDA and one payer states on this. We are we are one and full. I mean, we follow Chuck's lead as organizing on this is absolutely exemplary. Let's all get ready to support uh, this with uh, calls into our congressional offices. Uh, we'll hopefully get a list of targeted offices from Chuck in the next day or two. We'll get them out to our liaisons, and we will also PDA send on messages as well. So look for that as we support Sabuku, Sabuka. Uh, and the bill, again, uh, Rokana is introducing, and we're looking for original co-sponsors for the bill this upcoming week. Okay, so I also want to, of course, thank Jim Zogby very much for him joining us today and uh, all of the insights he provided around the ongoing crisis in, in Israel, Gaza. And um, thank you to everybody for being here. Of course, we'll be back next week with another PDA Town Hall. Our featured guest will be Anina Turner. And we'll be talking with her about everything in the world, but her new project supporting uh, the U.S. labor movement. So that is